We're on scene tonight with the New York City Police Department showing the dangers that officers face every day. Before we show you the body cam video, first let's listen to the 911 call coming from a man saying someone was armed at an intersection in Brooklyn, New York. There seems to be like a dog pacing up and down in some parts there. It seems like he has a, a gun and uh, it seems to be a, a pink knife in his hand. He's wearing like a, a Tommy Hilfiger jacket and it seems like he's just using he's force. The suspect, Yudis Pierre, actually described himself to the dispatcher. Police arrived and saw the suspect holding a knife in his left hand. Drop the knife, sir. Drop the knife. He's holding a knife on his right hand, uh, on his left hand, the right hand on his pocket. Officers demanded that Pierre drop the knife several times, drove in reverse as the suspect advanced instead of dropping the weapon. He entered a nearby subway station. You all right, buddy? You okay? Huh? We just want to talk to you, pal. Police gave Pierre space, remaining on the other side of the turnstiles, as a lieutenant talked to him. The lieutenant even motioned to an officer to unlock the gate, but not to walk in. Police continued to try to get the man to drop the knife and put his hands up. Take your right hand out of your pocket. Dude, get up there. Get up there. Taser? Put the knife down. Put the knife down. You okay, pal? Do you need help? We're here to help you, dude. Put the knife down. When Pierre didn't take, did not take his hand out of his pocket, two officers deployed tasers, which were not effective. Pierre then advanced toward the turnstiles, walking out as police went back up the stairs. He remained just inside of the station at the bottom of the stairs. Watch out behind you. Bye. Shoot. Pierre charged up the stairs, getting, as you can see, getting very close to an officer. Two officers opened fire, hitting Pierre in his chest and legs. He was taken to the hospital where he died from his injuries. Police recovered a knife at the scene. The incident remains under investigation. Joining me as always is Sean Stix Larkin, former Tulsa uh, police lieutenant. Um, all right, so Stix, first of all, it seems that the suspect called police and gave a description of himself. Was that clear, do you think, to the 911 operator? Was everyone aware of that when that call was first made? Uh, actually, no. From my understanding, this was not figured out until later. Uh, the investigation, from my understanding, they ended up finding an actual suicidal note, uh, or his family did, back at his house, what his intentions were. So, as you can hear by the 911 call, he's very calm. He actually gives a very clear description of himself, what he's armed with and where he's at. He just doesn't identify the fact that it's him. So officers think they're going to an armed, armed individual, possibly out there to hurt somebody else, but it sounds like the most clear cut case of a suicide by cop. So, you know, I actually want to listen to that 911 call again because I, I didn't realize at, the, at first that, that it was him making the call on himself. So let's listen to the 911 call again. There seems to be like a dog pacing up and down in some parts there. He seems like he has a, a gun and uh, it seems to be a, a, a pink knife in his hand. He's wearing like a, a Tommy Hilfiger jacket and it seems like he's just using he's force. This is a guy, it seems like, who's trying to die at the hands of cops. You know, absolutely. I mean, he's talking about himself in the third person. Uh, you know, the 911 operator, the responding officers, there's just no way they would know that he was calling in on himself with that type of intent. You know, and just as you mentioned here, the, the officers on scene, they gave this guy plenty of space. They tried the, uh, the taser deployment, actually even back out of the subway. And one of the things, obviously, you live in there in Manhattan. You know how busy New York City is. The fact that this is after 4 a.m., uh, very few people out, which is, uh, you know, very, very lucky because with the number of shots fired and this guy walking around with a knife, just a very dangerous situation. Yeah. And, and again, and we've seen this a lot on the show recently, that the taser was ineffective. 
And I think that, you know, a lot of people don't realize how ineffective those tasers can be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they tried it twice. You know, it was the supervisor on scene that tried it, and then a secondary officer did as well. Um, and listening to the body cam footage, one of them even talks about because the suspect is wearing the thick jacket, the tasers just had no effect. Suspect runs up the stairs into the street, and this is when the, the moment happens, right? And this is where he gets very close uh, to the officer. I want to show that as we're talking about it, um, because this is the, the critical moment when an officer needs to make that decision do I use deadly force or not? I, it, we don't have it right here, Sticks, but go ahead. So t talk to me about that yeah, moment. No. Yeah, you know, and one thing I want to point it out, uh, again, listen to the full body cams of this. They immediately requested their uh, emergency services unit. It's a full-time unit they have there in New York that specializes dealing with these type of calls. They just never were able to arrive on scene because of how fast the suspect pushed this thing, forcing the officers to use deadly force. And, and, and here's what's really tough about it. The guy obviously had the intent, you know, he wanted the police officers to kill him. And what's tough is these officers that were involved in this, the two officers that fired shots, they now have to go forward dealing with the fact that they took a man's life. Uh, it's a tough thing that weighs on those of us in law enforcement that have to, you know, do those type of things. You know, that's one of the things that I don't think we talk about enough is the psychological impact for the officers after they have shot someone. I mean, these are officers who are talking to this guy, trying to get him to just drop the knife, et cetera. They keep backing away from him giving him space, trying to make sure that they've got their distance from him. And then they end up being put in a position where he runs at one of the officers with a knife. And I, I don't think people think about the trauma that an officer who had to fire that weapon goes through. Yeah, you know, at one point in this profession, and just like the military, uh, you know, we had to have this bravado. People couldn't talk about themselves being upset. Um, it was a sign of weakness. And, and luckily, even during my own career, that has changed quite a bit. Departments are now equipped with counselors. There's other officers that are, uh, you know, peer counselors for officers. Um, and then there's civilian organizations, things like the Mighty Oaks Foundation and so forth, that are exactly doing that. They are helping the men and women in these professions that are dealing with these tough deals that do take a toll on us. Let me ask you then, have you dealt with this kind of situation yourself? Yeah, you know, Dan, uh, I was involved in two officer-involved shootings. Um, you know, throughout my career, I've been on numerous shootings, homicides, uh, other deaths, fatality, car accidents, suicides, and so forth. And as weird as it may sound, none of those personally bothered me the one case that did bother me was a two-year-old kid who at the time was the same age as my son that had been beaten by his parent. And just seeing this kid oh. hurt like that was something that I struggled with. Um, you know, and that's why it's so important for our departments to have yep. the counseling that we do. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.